I'm Evan Smith, the CEO of the Texas Tribune. On behalf of my colleagues at the Trib, I want to welcome you to this year's Texas Tribune Festival. Every one of our 11 years in business, the work of our nonprofit newsroom has been critically important, but never more than in 2020. We produce reliable, credible reporting on issues that affect everyday Texans, making them better informed and motivating them to participate civically. You and people like you, readers, supporters, attendees at our events, make our public service journalism possible. If you've managed to make it this far into the festival without becoming a Tribune member, there's still time. Donate by September 30th at texastribune.org slash give, and your gift will be triple by our friends at the Lowy Law Firm in Austin. Now on with the show. I hope you enjoy this conversation between U.S. Representatives Joaquin Castro and Henry Cuellar of Texas and Laura Barone Lopez, national political reporter for Politico. Hello, I'm Laura Barone Lopez, a national political reporter for Politico. I'm joined today by Congressman Joaquin Castro of San Antonio and Congressman Henry Cuellar of Laredo. We'll discuss the news of the day and the pandemic's impact on Texas, as well as the 2020 election and the Latino vote. So let's get right to it. Congressman Castro, I'd like to start with you. Uh, during the pandemic, there has been a lot of disinformation and conspiracy theories about the coronavirus. Are those conspiracies impacting Texas and your district and its ability to contain the disease? Well, you're right. I mean, there's been a lot of disinformation on social media and you've had people that have been logged on to social media a lot more during this pandemic. Uh, and it seems as though that disinformation has intensified around certain subjects. The election, of course, is one of them, but the other big one has been the, the pandemic and COVID-19. And in some quarters and in some messages, uh, this idea that uh, either COVID-19 is fake or it's not as powerful or dangerous as uh, scientists have claimed. And so, yes, I have seen a lot of people who have questioned uh, whether they really need to be taking certain precautions, whether the United States and Texas uh, really needed to, uh, you know, uh, shut down for a while, whether there needs to be a mask mandate, all of those things. So getting out correct and true information becomes more difficult and getting people to follow that correct information becomes more difficult when these rumors or misinformation swirls around. And a big piece of, of um I guess, getting back to some semblance of life is kids returning to school. And so in colleges, we've been seeing outbreaks uh, as they've been attempting to reopen. And K through 12 schools are also having difficulty preparing, uh, whether it's online courses or trying to do in-person learning. Congress and Cuellar, uh, are schools in your district able to ensure that uh, children uh, aren't falling through the cracks in terms of of their education and, and what are you hearing about their needs? Yes, and thank you, Laura, for that question. Look, you know, uh, first of all, Joaquin is right. First of all, you gotta look at the environment. There's a lot of misinformation going out there. Then you have a precedent that is, is trying to get the schools to open up, you know, order the schools to open up. That should belong to the local school districts or to a state, uh, to the parents where they make that decision, not coming in from the precedent. And you can understand the president is trying to show some sort of normalcy, but again, you don't put kids' uh, lives at, at risk. Uh, and what we're seeing from this pandemic are some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses uh, in our society. For example, one of the strengths you have parents that are doing the right thing, teachers are doing the right things. Uh, it's affecting them in so many ways because if they're at home online, uh, they have to stay home and it impacts them where they can't go to work till the kids get out of school. So it affects the parents' livelihood. At the same time, what we're seeing is the weaknesses uh, where we are having areas that don't have Wi-Fi, don't have broadband, and we have to put more money. This is what Joaquin, myself, uh, uh, Jim Clyburn, and other folks, we're pushing money to make sure that we add more money in the broadband. So we're seeing strengths of the individual, but at the same time, weaknesses, not having enough broadband or Wi-Fi or even laptops at home. Well, and I think that I mean, the whole country, uh, it really is between a rock and a hard place, as Henry was kind of suggesting there, because uh, on the one hand, 
many of our school districts still have not fully reopened and brought students back in because of the pandemic in order to be safe. At the same time, there are serious doubts about the, the effectiveness of distance learning that's going on right now. Uh, even with my kids, you know, I have a, a four-year-old and a six-year-old, one that's pre-K, one that's first grade, uh, and you can really tell the difference um, between when they go to class and now as they're doing distance learning. And it, it just feels as though they're not picking up the lessons in the same way. And are either of you hearing about these, uh, you know, these educational issues in disproportionately impacting Latinos or people of color more than their white counterparts? Uh, uh, without a doubt. Let me give you an example of what happened here in Texas. You know, under the CARES Act one, we sent uh, monies to the states uh, and to the local communities along with the schools. But what happened, it, it went through the state of Texas. Texas stayed with uh, a little bit over $6 billion of the CARES Act. Mm -hmm. uh, on top of that, they stayed with $1.2 billion that were supposed to go over to the, uh, to the uh, schools. And what they did is basically the state of Texas is hoarding uh, over seven and a half billion dollars. And I will tell you, by the end of the year, they probably will be closer to nine, ten billion dollars uh, of money that they're hoarding so they can use for the next session. Joaquin knows this. I know this. We have served in the state legislature. They're trying to fill in the gaps uh, for the next session. Uh, but the problem is those schools need the money right now. The schools with Hispanic uh, communities, uh, skids, need the money now, but they're hoarding that money and that money won't be available till October 1st of 2021 if the state gets its way. And I don't think that's fair to uh, Latinos or Hispanic uh, communities. And, and also, I mean, Congress right now is working on trying to pass another coronavirus relief package, but but there's been a stalemate. I mean, uh, so do you, uh, uh, Congressman Castro, I'll start with you, but do you think that uh, Speaker Pelosi should go even lower in terms of, of meeting Republicans, you know, below the 2.4 that, that she's already compromising on uh, in order to get this relief bill passed. Yeah, I know that, that Speaker Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, the rest of the Democratic leadership in the House of Representatives, including um, all of us, very much want to reach an agreement with Republicans in the Senate. But there also comes a point at which, uh, you know, you're simply not meeting the need by posting a very low number. For example, there was one proposal I'd read about that was $500 million or $600 million. Uh, and the need is so much greater in the country than that. So I'm still hopeful that we'll be able to reach an agreement with Republicans uh, by the end of this coming week or when we're out of session. Um, but it's made it very tough because it, they clearly... Uh, I don't think have their pulse on exactly what's happening and the need that's out there uh, or are not committed to filling it. Carson, you know, do you have anything to add on that front yet? Yeah, whether or not you think that 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 um, that Democrats need to go lower or should should you guys stay at the current number in terms of 2.4 trillion? Well, I think the question, Laura, should be should both sides uh, either go down and go up. Uh, look, I said on the appropriation, so we, you know, Joaquin and I, we understand what it is to deal with numbers. Pelosi started at $3.5 trillion. The Senate had their, quote, skinny version of $500 billion. Then the White House comes in, and then I think the last thing they said, they would not go over $1.5 trillion. On top of that, Pelosi went down to 2.4, so we're actually not that far away. But what makes this very difficult uh, for anybody that understands Washington politics when you deal with numbers, it should be between the House and the Senate. The Senate is non-existent. The Senate has given their power to Secretary Mnuchin and to Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. That's wrong. It should be between the House and the Senate. Uh, but it's frustrating because they gave their power over to the White House. And, and I think what they should do is if we're at 2.4, which I think will be the ne next uh, proposal from us, there are 1.5. It's not should the Democrats go down, mm -hmm. should both sides go down or up to reach an agreement so we can get it done this uh, this week. Well, and, and I also think, you know, the important thing is that we're doing something meaningful and substantive that's going to have a real impact. If your number is too low, it's just not going to be enough to have the impact that we need. What we don't want to do is just give people uh, you know, a reason to say that, well, they did something, right, mm -hmm. where it's just a matter of window dressing, and now they can go run their campaign saying that, you know, we offered 
uh, more relief to the American people. You, know, you got to offer something meaningful, substantive and impactful in what we're doing. In, in addition to the coronavirus disproportionately hospitalizing and killing Latinos and black people, the country is also facing a, a racial reckoning as hundreds of thousands protested against police violence after the killing of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, and more recently, the shooting of Jacob Blake uh, in Wisconsin. Uh, Congressman Castro, what do you see as Latinos' role in this larger movement and what impact has police brutality had within the Latino community? Well, uh, you know, in the recent, uh, what I would say is um, movement, right? And these were from the reports that I read, uh, the largest social justice movements that we've seen in the country uh, in modern American history, larger than the 1960s, that gives you a sense of scale. Uh, and Latinos have been very supportive of the black community. And I think that's at least in part because the Latino community has also suffered uh, from police brutality over the generations. You know, I when I spoke on the House floor, we passed when we passed the Justice and Policing Act, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, that's still languishing over in the Senate and has not been passed. Uh, but I I gave a case, uh, cited a case in San Antonio from 1980 where a Mexican American man. Uh, was shot to death by police. And before that case, that same officer had killed a black man years before. Uh, and so the Latino community has also experienced uh, police brutality. And I think uh, many folks are committed to changing to changing things. Uh, and, and the answer is actually uh, multi-layered and complex because you're talking about different levels of government that need to change. Local governments changing the way they bargain with police unions. Uh, state governments need to change their laws around uh, what police unions are able to bargain upon. Uh, and then finally, the federal government uh, demilitarizing needs to demilitarize the police uh, and also has something to say uh, about collective bargaining. Uh, so at each level of government, there's work for us to do. And as you mentioned, Democrats passed a police reform bill earlier this year. Um, Black Lives Matter organizers and a growing number of people within labor organizations are also calling for changes within police unions, which have amassed considerable political power and by some are viewed as an obstacle to uh, overall reform. A number of local labor chapters have called on big federations like AFL-CIO, SEIU, and AFSCME to expel their police unions. Congressman Cuellar, do you think that these labor organizations should expel those police from uh, from their federations? Well, you know, first of all, I support the uh, law enforcement uh, unions, whether it's in Texas, CLEAT, or even the national, or even some of the local uh, unions that we have. The question is not the unions. The question is, you know, what are the policies that should come out from a a city or a state legislature or even Congress. And we have to just be very, very careful that we don't go from one extreme. I do not support defunding the police. I support reform uh, and in appropriations, I add a different language and, and monies to address some of that. And at the same time, you know, we got to understand there's a legal system that if there's a bad apple, you go after that bad apple. Uh, you don't paint everybody with the same paintbrush. So we have to be careful to get away from extremes, whether it's the, um, and I'll say this, defund ICE, I think that's wrong. Uh, I think we need to look at reform, but not defund ICE. Defund police, uh, I think that's an extreme. We don't go that extreme, but we do need to make uh, some of the changes, and I think we can do that. But to say, get rid of a, a, of a union, I don't think that's the uh, what we need to look at. What we ought to do is look at what are the policies, and, and certainly, you know, Joaquin, myself, and other folks, we can work on some policies in Congress, and of course, our state legislature, where we both serve, they're going to do their work, and I think the local police needs to do uh, their work. I mean, the local, um, uh, uh, you know, city council should do their work. Everybody has a role on this, but let's not take any extreme positions. Well, you know, and as Democrats, I mean, look, historically, we have been supportive of labor unions and the right of unions to collectively bargain, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and we still are supportive of workers in that way. But I do think that with police unions in particular, uh, what I would do is, is eliminate their ability to 
bargain on accountability issues. In other words, they can bargain on wages and health care benefits and so forth. But I think that you get into very uh, dangerous and dicey territory when they're able to bargain on accountability provisions, because what we've seen is that the way that it's evolved over the years is that these these provisions are protecting even the very worst officers. Uh, and that makes it difficult to change uh, the police department uh, to make sure that it's truly working with the community. Uh, and so I just think those things need to change. And I'd like to get to the election. Uh, so. Uh Congressman Castro, you know, the Hispanic Caucus uh, campaign arm has raised a lot of money this cycle, um, and they played in more primaries, including uh, throwing their weight behind Candace, Vela, Ve sorry, Candace Valenzuela um, of Congressional District 24, uh, which actually put them a little bit at odds with the DCCC, the, the overall House campaign arm for Democrats. Do you think the Hispanic Caucus, uh, its campaign arm, should play more in primaries in the future? Um, especially after what we witnessed this cycle with, with challengers to incumbents becoming more of the norm? Yeah, I mean, I, I know that the race between Candace Valenzuela and Kim Olson, for example, was an open seat, right? The open Democratic primary. I don't think the that Bullpack took on any Democratic incumbents uh, in the primaries. But, you know, should they be involved in open primary races? Yeah, absolutely. I think they should. Um, you know, right now there are 39 Latinos that are part of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, and we hope that that number will grow over the next few years, that it'll pass 40, for example. But even if it passes 40, uh, you know, Latinos are uh, about 18 and a half percent of the country. And so we're still pretty far below uh, where we should be in terms of congressional representation. So I would hope and expect that Bullpack is going to continue uh, to support very well qualified Latinos and Latinas who decide to run for Congress. And uh, Democrats have been talking for a while about Texas turning blue. Um, I know that uh, lately the presidential uh, averaging of polls shows that it's, it looks like a tight race in Texas, um, but, but it still would be a heavy lift for Democratic nominee Joe Biden to win that state. Congressman Cuellar, um, do you expect more House seats to, to flip this uh, this cycle? And, and what do you make of, of Biden's odds in the state? Uh, first of all, I think he's got a good shot at the uh, at Texas, number one. Do I expect some of the um, uh, seats to flip over at the congressional? Yes, Jen Ortiz, uh, uh, and you can name a whole bunch of them uh, that uh, we can win. I really think we can win the, those seats at the state level where both Joaquin and I serve. Yes, uh, you know, I've been working with the um, with the folks there. You know, we used to call our uh, branch at that time the the, the Texas uh, Partnership, if you remember. Uh, so whatever name, we got to win uh, not only Texas House seats, but also congressional. I really think we have a good shot. Look, when a Democrat runs against a Republican statewide, the numbers are usually about 800,000 to 1 million vote difference on that. Beto O'Rourke brought it down to about 220,000, and he did a couple of things that was important. He got the vote out, but if you look at the state of Texas, the, the firewall that Republicans have is called rural Texas. You see the urban areas and the border areas are blue and everything is red. What uh, Beto did, he, he there's two things that I think you need to do. One, you need to show up, and he did show up in the uh, rural areas. And two, you got to have a way to talk to the rural uh, uh, areas. If you're able to talk to them, uh, the issues are important that we can win uh, because we saw that with Beto O'Rourke, when he showed up and that brought it down from 800,000 to 1 million votes to a difference of about 220,000 uh, votes. So we have a shot. Uh, and I've never, I haven't seen this type of energy uh, from the Democrats in a long, long time. When I was in the House, and I'll let Joaquin finish there, you had, I served under uh, Pete Laney, I served under Gib Lewis, Democratic speakers. Uh, on, the, on the Senate side, you had Bill Hobby and Bob Bullock, you know, moderate conservative uh, members, but we're all Democrats, and I think we can do it again. Yeah, and I think Joe Biden is right in the hunt in terms of winning Texas. Uh, I, obviously, it's a Herculean effort because of the cost and the investment that's required. But I'm encouraged that the Biden campaign is spending some money in Texas and Henry and myself and 
other members of the Texas congressional delegation have a standing meeting with the campaign to encourage them uh, to invest more heavily in Texas. I think MJ Hager's got a shot at John Cornyn. She's closing that gap. Uh, and then, you know, I've been telling folks that we're going to send between uh, four and six Texas Democrats to Washington uh, after November for January. And then we need nine seats to pick up the state house. And I also think that we can get those. We got 12 in 2018. I think we can pick up the nine we need to flip the state house uh, for 2020. Should, should Biden travel to Texas? He His campaign appears to be investing more, as both of you said, but so far he hasn't decided to make that a, a campaign stop. Right. Yeah, well, look, certainly, I mean, if the vice president, to the extent that he is traveling in person and so forth, then I certainly hope that he considers Texas as a place that he'll come. You know, I think that the great thing about the state is you can you know fly to the different big cities um, pretty quickly. And so, yeah, I hope that he would consider a stop in Texas uh, if he is going to travel. Uh, I think that would go a long way in even creating even more buzz and more energy. You know, uh, uh, Texans are not right now fans of Donald Trump. They've seen that he's failed the country on the pandemic. Uh, they, you know, he really, the way he, just the way he carries himself is not consistent with how Texans act. Um, and so I think Joe Biden has a real opportunity here. And, and so outside of Texas, uh, Biden is, is underperforming in some key battlegrounds like Florida among Latinos. Uh, he's trailing Clinton's 2016 showing by one of the more recent polls, about 11 points. Um, and so Congressman Cuellar, I mean, what do you think that he should be doing? I know we're going outside of Texas a bit now, but, but to be reaching those Latino voters um, in states like Florida and Arizona. Well, you know, first of all, when you look at the uh, six to eight uh, uh, battleground states, uh, Biden is winning uh, on those. I, I do know that, of course, Florida has been challenging. And certainly, uh, I think uh, both uh, Joaquin and I have been insisting that they need to do more on Spanish media, reaching out to the Hispanics, uh, doing a lot more uh, uh, than what they've been doing. And I think they're stepping up on that. But if you look at the six to eight uh, battleground states, uh, Biden is actually winning, but I do uh, have to say that Florida has been very challenging. Congressman Castro, before I move on, I mean, is there anything that you want to add about uh, what you think they could change in terms of, of uh, ensuring that, that more Hispanics in Florida uh, turn his way? Well, I mean, the first thing is that, you know, I know that there's been this comparison between where Hillary Clinton was at this time in 2016 and where Joe Biden is in 2020. And those comparisons are natural. And it looks like maybe he's he's lagging a few points behind. But this has also been an extraordinary campaign season uh, in terms of the fact that the vice president has, hasn't been able to travel, that the Latino community is the community that's been the most impacted by the coronavirus, by so many measures. Uh, and so I think that he's just got to get out there and the campaign's got to make the investment in uh, all kinds of advertising that reaches a Latino market, including Spanish language advertising. And I think a lot of his message should be about helping the country bounce back and helping the Latino community bounce back from a president who failed us during this pandemic. Uh, this was a community that was making its way back economically from the Great Recession still and now gets hit, hit again like this. And then the second thing, Laura, is that he's really the campaign. And I know that they're, they've started to do this but really have to take it very seriously, this disinformation that I believe the Trump campaign and other sources are aiming at the Latino community uh, with all kinds of rumors about who Joe Biden is and so forth, and mm -hmm. doing it in Spanish to, spe to Latinos who are primarily Spanish speaking, uh, they've got to make sure to you know, attack that early on and dispel it early on. If not, you know, if you let it go unchallenged, it can take on a life of its own over the next six weeks. Have either of you, Congressman Blair, have you seen disinformation like that? I know we talked about coronavirus disinformation, but but uh, disinformation on the election about Joe Biden um, permeating the Latino community in Texas? Well, I, I mean, I haven't seen that. I'm a little busy up there in D.C. I think we got enough misinformation coming out, out of the White House itself. But uh, uh, but yeah, I keep hearing that. But, uh, you know, I'm right now our concern is what happens there in Congress and what comes out of the White House. And hopefully after November, uh, after this election, uh, we will have somebody that will bring a little bit more reasonable, more calm approach to how we address this. 
but you know, every day, you know, we keep hearing hearing this thing from the White House. You know, the last thing, uh, among a lot of things, but uh, uh, one of the last things that got me concerned was when he was asked, when President Trump was asked, hey, are you going to concede the election? Are you going to have a peaceful transition? When the President of the United States cannot say that, uh, that he would, that is something that you hear in other countries. You don't hear that uh, from the United States. And I hope that, that the Republicans, House members and Senate members, uh, come out and, and say that they will abide to a peaceful uh, uh, transition. We don't hear that. We're not supposed to hear this from the United States of America, from the president of the United States. And that type of, um, I call it misinformation coming out is just very concerning to me. Well, so and what's well, and what's strange about that, Henry, also is that, you know, the Trump campaign is making this bogus claim that Joe Biden and Democrats uh, are socialist or pushing for socialism, when in fact, Donald Trump is acting like a lot of the leaders the strongmen, authoritarian leaders that we've seen over generations in some La in other parts of the world as well, but in Latin America, you know, that's the irony is that he's actually the person who is who has taken on those traits by refusing to say that basically even if he loses the election, you know, he won't concede defeat, uh, which is like Henry said, that's something that you would, you know, expect to see. Uh, in El Salvador in the 1980s or something, or some other part, some other country of the world, we're not used to hearing that in the United States by a United States president. Right. The president repeated twice, actually, that, that he wasn't he wasn't committing to a peaceful transfer of power. Some Republicans did speak out and say that it was ludicrous and say that um, say that they that no matter what they there would be a peaceful transfer of power. But but on a related topic. Um, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away about more than a week ago, and the president has been making comments that he's looking to potentially uh, that Supreme Court uh, as a way to resolve the election because, again, he is um, inaccurately claiming that the system may be rigged. But uh, that Supreme Court seat, that vacant seat, could be filled right before the election. Republicans show that they are moving, uh, you know, full steam ahead. So if Democrats were to then win the White House and gain more control in Congress, Congressman Cuellar, do you support expanding the court, which is something that, that Democrats have been talking about as a possible option? Well, first of all, I don't like what the uh, president is doing, uh, what the Republicans are doing. Back in February of 2016, uh, Mitch O'Connor said, oh, it's an election year, let the winner of the November election uh, decide. Uh, now, of course, they're backtracking. They're trying to move this, I think, by uh, October 20, 29th, trying to do it right before the election. I think it's wrong. I think the president, what he is doing right now is laying the groundwork by saying it's it's an uh, you know, illegal system. It's, you know, I mean, he's laying the groundwork uh, for some sort of uh, lawsuit or lawsuits to take it up. And I think he said one time that the Supreme Court might have the last say so almost uh, referring to the 2000 election that we had in the Supreme Court at that time. So you can see almost he's laying the groundwork to something uh, sinister that he's trying to lay out here. Do I believe in packing of the court? Uh, I'm one of those, I don't. I don't like what's happening, but I don't like, uh, if you look at the history, we've gone from you know X amount of courts, uh, I mean, judges to a different out. I, I don't like the packing of the court. Uh, at least that's my, you know, what I'm looking at right now. But I definitely do not like what the um, uh, what the Republican, uh, what the Republicans and the president are doing right now. So that's something that I would have to consider. But my leaning is no to packing. And then Congressman Castro, very quickly, because I want to get to one more question before the end. But do you think that Democrats should consider expanding the court? if they gain more power in Congress? Yeah, let me put some context to that question because I think it's very important. And like Henry said, uh, I think both of us strongly disagree with uh, what we're seeing and how the Republicans have conducted themselves, not just now, but in the last few years with regard to the Supreme Court. So our institutions are longstanding and have important traditions that have helped keep our country stable. I think everybody would agree with that. But they're all also, I'm going to use another analogy here of uh, the Electoral College. There are instances where it's clear that that system is also failing us, I believe. So two times within 16 years, uh, a president took office after 
winning the electoral college, but losing the popular vote. And because of that, and this last president, Donald Trump, losing by over three million votes, I think a lot of Americans take stock of that, take stock of that, and and believe that look, somebody that loses the election by, or let me say it the other way, somebody that wins an election by three million votes should be become the next president. So when you think about the Supreme Court, there are a few things that have happened. Number one, a few years ago, Mitch McConnell refused to give President Obama. Uh, or Merrick Garland, President Obama's nominee, on a simple up or down vote in the United States Senate on that appointment. And then the reason they gave for that was that it was it was a nomination that was occurring close to an election. So you fast forward now to 2020 and the passing of Justice Ginsburg, and we're now in a situation that proves the Republicans' point from 2016 even more. Uh, and so what do they do? They completely flip-flop. So you essentially have one political party now that has done everything they can to both deny Democrats a court seat, uh, some people claim steal a court seat, right, by not giving an up or down vote, and then being completely hypocritical and rushing through a nomination right before an election. So you ask the question then, with that context, should we consider uh, adding members to the court? because of the long tradition and the importance of these institutions, my actual inclination, my first inclination is, I hope that we don't have to, to do that. I would rather not do that. But what you're seeing is one party that's committed to basically cheating at every turn and doing everything that they can to take a court seat. My preference actually, and I've had this debate with my brother, because I think a few days ago, he said that he would uh, expand the court. My mm -hmm. preference actually, if we're gonna make significant changes to the court, would be to term limit the justices, to add some kind of term limit to the justices so that people are rotating off of the court and appointments can be made more often. Um, but look, at this point, when you have one party uh, that is uh, basically doing everything they can to lie, cheat, and steal on this, then it's not a surprise to me that we're gonna have to consider different options uh, to remedy this. So uh, we are pretty much out of time, but I do have one lightning round question very quickly for the two of you. Um, if Biden were to win the White House, what is the number one um, issue at the top of your list for his first 100 days? Uh, Congressman Quay, are you first? Uh, pr uh, protect the Affordable Health Care Act. I mean, I know that's going to be uh, probably challenging the Supreme Court again, but the Affordable Health Care Act was something that we voted back about 10 years ago. In fact, we lost the majority. I lost a lot of my blue dog uh, Democrats. We lost the majority, but that was the right vote. In fact, I still have people in Laredo and other parts that still don't support me because I, for, uh, I um, uh, supported the Affordable Health Care Act. It was the right thing to do. Uh, it was the right thing to do. And I think we need to do that because there are millions of people that depend on the Affordable Health Care Act. We need to expand it, Medicaid expansion, uh, but we need to support that. Okay. Congressman Castro? I think the first thing has to be ridding this country of this pandemic, uh, doing everything that the new administration can to ridding the country of the pandemic, uh, because it's claimed over 200,000 American lives. It will certainly be more by January if Joe Biden does come in as president. Um, you know, as you know, there are going to be a lot of things to take on in that first 100 days. But I think foremost, uh, the president has to focus on getting rid of the coronavirus. Well, thank you to you both so much, Congressman Cuellar and Congressman Castro. This has been a fascinating conversation. And thank you to everyone joining us uh, at the Tribune Festival.